Hello, I'm Robert Griffin, the Executive Minister here at the Sunshine Cathedral in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I want to thank you for joining us for worship via the internet today. And if you are ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, let me personally invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We also invite you to join us on our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter. But for this moment, let's go inside and see what exciting worship opportunity lay in store for us. which brings us together in the presence of the Most High. To face our ideals, to remember loved ones, to give thanks, to be enlightened, and to be strengthened. In this consecrated space breathes the worship of ages. Three unseen guests attend, faith, hope, and love. Let all our hearts prepare them place. Amen. Our first reading is from the wisdom of Carter Hayward. God is a relational power, not a person. Neither God nor Jesus nor the rest of us can be known and loved in authoritarian, non-mutual relation. As a system of social control, patriarchy is a system of non-mutual relation. For this reason, love and patriarch are patriarchy are incompatible. Love is a mutual relation. In the beginning and in the end, God is a relation. God is not a self-contained entity or a self-absorbed being. God is love, the constant immediate yearning and effort to make mutuality incarnate throughout the whole cosmos. God is the commitment against all odds to justice with compassion. God is the spirit celebrating mutuality, the energy generating justice, the root of compassion, the power and the yearning, the effort and the commitment. God is radically loving community, every unfolding, changing, living, dying, and yet ever living, in a literal sense, embodied, sensual, transformative. God is holy communion. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading is from the Gospel according to Luke. When Jesus had completed all his words in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. When he heard of Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jewish community to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they asked him earnestly, saying, you should do this for him, for he is worthy. 
for he loves our nation and he has built us a synagogue. So Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Likewise, I did not think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. When Jesus heard these words, he marveled at him and turned and said to the people who followed him, I tell you, I have not found such great faith. Then those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. In these human words, God's voice is heard. My grandfather somehow uh, escaped baptism. He couldn't even swim. I mean, he just had an aversion to water, I think. But even as a baby, he was not baptized. And uh, he died pretty young. I was in high school. And I remember being tormented that he hadn't been baptized. Now, he had taken how many thousands of baths in his life, but none of that counted. He got caught in the rain how many times, but none of that counted. In fact, my grandfather was struck by lightning once. He got caught in the rain and was struck by lightning. Survived, um, but uh, never had a ritual in a church with someone dressed like they normally wouldn't dress, sprinkling just a little bit of water on him. And so I was tormented when he died. In my 17-year-old spirituality and mindset, I thought he might somehow be kept from the presence of God over a few drops of water. When I say it out loud now, I'm almost 50 years old, when I say it out loud now, it sounds ridiculous. But at 17, I was tormented. And I prayed. I spent hours, days, weeks in prayer trying to negotiate with God. Actually, I didn't really like God. I was scared of God. And so I didn't really spend a lot of time with God. I spent a lot of time with Jesus and Mary. Anything to avoid God. And so I, was trying to, so I was trying to negotiate with Jesus. I'm like, I hear you're the high priest. They keep calling you some sort of high priest. So maybe you could baptize him in heaven. If you just, if you just let him do, you like come outside the gate and sprinkle some water. I mean, I'm coming up with crazy stuff. Because I was afraid that God would have rejected my grandfather over a few drops of water. Much later in life. Well, actually, my grandfather died. Uh, and we called my favorite great aunt, not my great aunt Gladys, <laughs> her sister, my great aunt Viola. And my great aunt Viola was my very, I mean, she was, her, the last thing she ever said to me was that I was the son she never had. I told my uncle that, and he got angry because he <laughs> said she used to tell that to me. Um, I'm like, well, snooze you lose, you get bumped off. But <laughs> keep, you got to keep up. But my great, so we called my great aunt Viola to, to tell her that her brother-in-law had died and her husband answered the phone and he said, oh, well, Viola just died. My grandfather and favorite great aunt died five minutes apart. So, I'm 17, so I'm thinking, all right, God is just not reliable or worse, mean. And for some reason, religion is so encoded in my body, so encoded in my bones, so encoded in my brain, I just could not not be religious. I couldn't give it up. But every Sunday, when we'd pray the Lord's Prayer, I wouldn't say, thy will be done. Because thy will is obviously hateful sometimes. And I'm not asking for that. I am not asking for hatefulness. That went on for years, where I just omitted that line of the prayer. I am not praying any such foolishness. Well... Years of struggle and education and therapy and medication. <laughs> and I'm happy to say I have a much bigger and better God today. <laughs> and I would never promote, share, preach, or offer the God of my childhood to anyone. The God of my childhood is still the God of some of the adults where I come from. A few years ago, when my father died, my aunt, my only living aunt, his sister, 
decided that she needed to reach out to me and help me. Now, I've been ordained since 1997. I have two seminary degrees. I've been doing this for a long time. I wouldn't even stop going to church when I just almost hated God. I am a person of prayer and study and devotion, and my aunt, who in her 70s started going back to church, sent me a letter full of love, sweetness, just wanting me to know how damnably, damnably wrong I was about everything and how there was one way to God, and it wasn't the way I was following, and she just needed me to know that. And my response was, I just needed her to know that she could lose my address, phone number, and email, <laughs> and that she was entitled to that God, but I had no use for him. And yes, I said that on purpose, him. I had no use for that God. That God was not a God of mutuality. That God was not a God of love. That God was not a God of compassion. That God got here first and so got to make all the rules and was really petty and really nasty about it. That God only had room for so many people. And that God, the people that that God had room for, had to sort of feed that God's ego or they had no chance. As a matter of justice, as a matter of integrity, if there was such a God, I would dedicate my life to opposing that God, just as I oppose every tyrant I have come across in my life. But then there is Episcopal feminist theologian, Carter Hayward, offering us a different way of understanding God, a different experience of God. The Reverend Dr. Carter Hayward says, God is a relational power. I bring something to this relationship. I get to bring who I am into this. I have some say in all of this. I have a seat at God's table. It's not just do this or get cracked in the head or cracked on the knuckles or, or flicked off in, into some sort of eternal punishment. No, I get to bring who I am because who I am is part of God. I am part of the relationship. God is relationship. God is, she says, holy communion. For God to be and for me to be, we must be in union together. I must be part of God. And so, once God is this loving presence, now, I still, I, I think fondly of my memories of Mary when she was so central in my childhood. But I think fondly of Jesus and look to him as a moral example and, and an example of what it means to stand for social justice and to see God in other people. But I just don't need mediaries anymore. My relationship with God in my adult and, frankly, midlife years is all about God. I don't need anything between me and God because there is nothing between me and God. God is the all in all. And this loving omnipresence is more real to me, and I experience it more deeply as I contemplate this reality, that God is a relational power. God is holy communion. God is a benevolent presence with which we are one. There's not a spot where God is not. And that was Jesus's experience, and that was Jesus's message, and that was Jesus's mission. Every act recorded, every act of Jesus recorded in the Gospels shows Jesus helping people understand that God is an all-embracing, loving presence that leaves no one out. When I see online, when I see on blogs, when I see in newsletters, when, when I hear uh, uh, preachers from those old schools, Tell us what you have to do to get God's favor and what you have to do to get God's attention and what you have to do to get God's forgiveness. I just want to shout out loud to everyone they're talking to, there's a different story. You can believe that one if you want to, but there's another one. There's Carter Hayward. There's, dare I say it, Jesus, who offers a counter narrative of a loving presence that leaves no one out. The scriptures say that the Canaanite should be destroyed on sight. But when a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus, he sees her sacred value and he heals her daughter. 
religion said, even scripture said that the Canaanite was beyond the reach of God's love, and Jesus said, I'm not buying it, and I'm certainly not selling it. And so, Jesus, every act, the tradition said, the scripture said, the religion said that people with leprosy were untouchable, and Jesus said, I'm not buying it, and I'm certainly not selling it. And he touched the untouchables. Scripture said, tradition said, religion said, children should be seen and not heard. And Jesus said, let the children come to me then. I'll have some time for them. The apostles were like, don't bother, don't bother the teacher. And the teacher says, shut up, apostles, let the kids come. Tell them, bring their coloring books, bring their jacks, I'll play with them. We'll have a minute. The scripture said that a woman caught in adultery could be stoned. And when a woman is about to be stoned because she has been caught in adultery, Jesus steps up and says, well, who was she caught in adultery with? Adultery is not a one-person activity. (laughs) Every act of Jesus recorded in the Gospels is him showing an all-inclusive, unconditional, omnipresent love that we call God and offering that understanding of God to people so that if they had felt broken, they could now feel whole. That if they had felt wounded, they could now feel well. If they had felt that they were diseased, they could now be at ease. If they had been marginalized, they could now feel part of the everlasting family of God. He was sharing this relational power and an understanding of it that brought people into an understanding that they mattered, that they had sacred value, and that the love that God is would never let them go. And we see that in today's gospel lesson. A man is sad because his, we'll call him servant, is ill. But the language... And the context of the story, the original language and the context suggest that the servant is actually the man's lover, which would explain why a nobleman, an occupier of this territory would go to one of the occupied peasants for help. How desperate must you be? And you aren't just that desperate for one of your employees. No, you love someone to humble yourself like that to go crawling on hand and knees, to say, I'm going to send people to you because I'm not even worthy to address you myself. But someone I love dearly is in need, and I will do whatever I can for this person. The scriptures say that God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God lives in them. This Roman centurion, he was a pagan. He was not part of Jesus' culture. He was not part of Jesus' religion. But he loved somebody. And our Bible says that to love somebody truly is to express the love that God is. And so he did whatever he could for this person he loved. Now, many people, many religious people would have said to this Roman soldier, you're not part of my religion. You're not part of my culture. In fact, you are part of a class that is oppressing us. You are an occupier in our country. You've got your nerve asking us for help. Sorry for your luck. Hope it gets better, but don't come to me. You can't ask me to care. And then there are those who would take that a step further and say, oh, you've got some bad luck in your life. That must be God punishing you. That must be God lifting God's hands of protection off of you. That must be God teaching you some lesson. That all of that pain and suffering must be God. Oh, luckily, he didn't go to any of those religious people. Thank God he found Jesus. Because Jesus' response to the suffering man was compassion. Jesus' response to the person who loved someone so much that his heart ached to see him sick and suffer, his response was compassion. In the worst of the age crisis, when there were no medications and no hope, and it was a certain death sentence, we thought, a famous television evangelist, I won't call his name, I'll just make up a name, Jerry Falwell, said... misused a quote from the Apostle Paul to say that the age crisis was proof that God is not mocked. He said it was God's punishment for same gender love and attraction, that it missed so many lesbians he didn't seem to think about. But in any case, he dared to blame suffering on God. But Jesus responded to suffering with compassion because God is love, and to serve a God that is love means to serve with compassion. There's no other way. 
And so the man says, my servant, who I love more than most people love a servant, is very ill, and I am desperate. And Jesus responds with love and compassion and care. Jesus knows that God is with the Roman. Jesus knows that God is with the the servant. Jesus knows that there's not a spot where God is not. And so the future has infinite possibilities, even for this Roman and for the person he loves. That is Jesus' mission. That is Jesus' message. And that is, with all my heart, what I want the mission of the Sunshine Cathedral to be. I want us, as Jesus did, to say over and over to every single person who will listen that God's love is unconditional and all-inclusive and everlasting. I want everyone who has ever received a well-meaning but devastatingly misguided letter from an aunt. I want every such person to hear, you are God's miracle and not God's mistake. I want everyone who has lost a loved one and thought that they were somehow beyond the reach of God's love for lack of a few drops of water to hear your loved one is forever safe in the love that God is. I want everyone who ever heard that God was a a shark in the ocean of life just out to get them. I want them to hear another narrative so they can say, maybe they got it wrong and God is love and my love is God's gift to me and how I share it is my gift to God. That's what I want so, so very much. That's why we reach out in so many ways. That's why we have all these groups and these classes and these concerts. And that's why we'll have drag shows and, and contests. That's why we'll do everything, movie nights and picnics. We'll do all kinds of things that don't seem like traditional church. But let me tell you about traditional church. Traditional church told me that my grandfather was in eternal peril because his life had six less drops of water than it might have. So I'm not interested in that kind of church. I want a different kind of church, the kind of mission. In fact, let's just drop church from it all together if we can. I want the kind of mission that Jesus modeled. We're not here to promote or protect a denomination. Denominations are in decline. Don't tell them, but it's true. They are in decline because they are guarding the past rather than leading into the future. They are protecting the status quo instead of challenging it. They are trying to maintain what was instead of trying to figure out what could be. Now, Sunshine Cathedral has some affiliations for now, but I insist that we are and remain trans-denominational and post-denominational. We will not go the way of denominations. We will go the way of Jesus' mission. We are not here to promote or protect religion. God, the power of omnipresent love, the source and substance of all that is, does not have a religion. I'll let you soak that in for a second. That may be news. But why would God need a religion? What did God do before we created religions? God isn't Catholic, but Catholics are part of God. God isn't Jewish, but Jews are part of God. God isn't Buddhist, but Buddhists are part of God. God isn't Muslim, but Muslims are part of God. God isn't Hindu, but Hindus are part of God. Religion is our tool. It's not necessary to God. It's for us. It is our tool, but let it never be our weapon. We are here to be faithful to a mission, not a tradition, not ritual, not even to sacred text, not to what was, not to names. We are here to be faithful to a mission, and that mission is sharing the message of divine omnipresence, a relational power, a holy communion, a union with all that is and all that ever will be. So on your way into the operating room, I want you to know God is with you. As you are mourning the loss of your loved one, I want you to know God is with you and with your loved one. 
one. As you are applying for that job, I want you to know God is with you. As you are recovering from the betrayal of a friend, I want you to know that God is with you and with that friend. As you are missing that lost pet, I want you to know that God is with you and with that pet. As you are facing challenges and important decisions in your life, I want you to know that God is with you because God has to be, because there's not a spot where God is not. This relational loving power is everywhere, fully present, is with you in your moment of need and in your moment of celebration. And so because right where you are, God is, the future has infinite possibilities. We are here to say to every person possible, God is with you, and this is the good news. Amen. Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.